Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Kevin Long from the longview.com.au. Now, Kevin from Australia has offered his quarterly website forecasting service since 2008 for farmers as a community service to help people navigate their way through cyclical non-carbon dioxide climate change in southeastern Australia Specific area on the planet, Kevin's based in Bendingo, Victoria, and he offers weather commentary for Murray Darling Basin. Queensland has, has after seven years with low rainfall, but down here in Victoria, you know, it usually only lasts for one season at the peak of an El Nino event, and usually the year after an El Nino event it is a above average year, and we saw that in 2016. We had a strong El Nino event in 2015, that blew a lot of uh, moisture and heat up in the upper atmosphere. And six months later, that was travelling over Australia. And wacko, we had 200% rain for six months while it was here. And then as soon as it sort of left Australia, it created a sea ice crash of about six times the normal rate that we see sea ice being lost from Antarctica. So we went from the highest ever measured sea ice extent in Antarctica to the lowest in just over 12 months. And that's like six times faster than normal because it normally takes about three years to go from the high point to the low point. And we normally only move down about a third of the way that we did this time. Have a look at the, um, the graph, the, the sea ice graph, the long-term sea ice graph on climate for you. Our local paper wouldn't print the letters that I wanted to send into the letters of the editor in their form that I put them in. They had to change them and alter them and make them not make sense. So I ended up setting up a website so I could put that information out. Yeah, and again, that website is thelongview.com.au. Yeah, and over there on the right side, you'll see where it says links inside there, yep. and there's also supporting documents. Uh, the current forecast, which I know you just put out, you said you put out the spring forecast. There's so much else going on. You talked about the sea ice cycle. Now, in your opinion, what is going to happen? I have my own opinion about the northern hemisphere and the Arctic sea ice due to cooler water being pushed under the ice cap for the next nine years for the Atlantic waters with the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. But with the drying effect you're talking about and the drought occurring and going to amplify, what will this do with the Antarctic? That is associated with the development of an El Nino cycle. When an El Nino cycle is building, you are storing heat on the equator and you're uh, starving heat from the polar region so we see a growth in sea ice at that time and as the sea ice grows and the El Nino builds our climate dries out here in Australia so we move down to about 50% of average rainfall normally under extreme points every 37.2 years when we have the lunar cycle working with the monsoon cycle we see the extremes get greater we get wetter years in the wet part of it, and we get drier years 9.3 years later. Nine-year cycle seems to be a thing in the northern hemisphere as well for the pulse water going under the Arctic ice sheet. So now it's kind of confirmed that there's going to be sea ice growing in the southern hemisphere and sea ice growing in the northern hemisphere. So I'm wondering how the IPCC is going to start to explain away all of these sea ice growths that were no longer going down to the to the low points that now from every year forward it's going to continue to increase, increase, increase. So any, any projections on how they're going to try to sell this to the public? Remember when we were told snow would be a thing of the past? Well, now they're saying global warming creates more snow yeah. because of more evaporation in the oceans. And yet for 30 years we've had a growing sea ice caper in Antarctica. On average it's been growing for 30 years now. And yet nobody in Australia knows that. Hardly anybody. They all concentrate on what's been happening in the Northern Hemisphere. That's what comes on our media. And the Arctic has been declining for the last 30 years. And the Antarctic has been increasing for the last 30 years. Now, I believe the Arctic is still decreasing because of the extra land mass in the Northern Hemisphere, land being a better solar collector than sea. So we're still seeing heat building up in the Northern Hemisphere 
30 years after we started to lose heat out of the southern hemisphere. Right? Because of our larger sea masses in the southern hemisphere, uh, we're seeing the first effects of global cooling in the south, not in the north. Well, I'm going to add a little information. It is just this year's information. It does not even go any further than just a few months back. Northern Hemisphere had all-time record snow cover for the Northern Hemisphere, something like 700 billion extra tons of snow on the ground for a longer duration. And you know the albedo effect. So what you just talked about seems to be in its, shall we say, downward spiral because all the extra snow, they even talked about this in several articles with the amount of intense snow cover and far above the norm across the northern hemisphere that what you're talking about absorption into land and ocean specifically land just didn't occur as quickly as it could have this year because of the extended snow cover across this part of the world up here so that's kind of a new one in there you can find the northern hemisphere snow totals and you'll see that red line just straight above the averages and completely just whoa it's so far out there they need to put a new band up there for a snow total, that was interesting right. to see them. So when you were talking about the drier lunar air tide transition phase, is that correct? So it's 10 days short of a year, which means that the southern air tide has a peak each year, but next year it'll be 10 days earlier in the year. And it slowly works around the calendar backwards, and it takes 37.2 years to, to circulate right round through one year. So. When you have the southern air tide working in the middle of the winter time, it is able to produce more rainfall than when it's working in the summertime. And consequently, the same thing occurs with the northeast air tide, which occurs almost six months before or after the peak of the southern air tide. And when the northeast air tide is working in the middle of summer with the monsoon season, that's one of the drivers of these big rainfall events that we've just had in 2010 and the previous one in 1973. Does that make sense? Have I explained it well enough? Absolutely. Going through here, I'm going to include graphs and uh, charts inside every segment that we've talked about so you can get a visual representation. You know, the podcast is one thing. You can listen to it on the go. You can listen to it while you're working out, while you're driving to work. But when you do get back, make sure you hit the video on YouTube because I'm going to add all the slides in so it's very crystal clear on what we have been talking about. Because really, a picture is worth a thousand words. We could try to describe charts and graphs, but until you actually look at it... Time and time again, when they forecast rain events and they just fade away and, and they don't work because the air tide is working against it. On other times, we, we, we get a rain event that they didn't forecast because the rain event came on the peak of an air tide. You know, and that seems to be sort of a standard thing where um, they forget variables in the models, but they guarantee you the model is, it's so perfect that it is forecasting out 200 years, but they forget so many of these cloud cell variables, anything, they forget so many natural variables inside there, even galactic cosmic rays, etc. And they expect us to, you know, take their word for it as that's the right. gospel when truth got that the this model, the model is the thing that's going to forecast out. But how do you forecast when you're forgetting parts of the whole? seems like you have quite a few of the drivers that they don't take into consideration. And when I say they, I'm talking about the uh, United Nations bodies that are putting out all the information that continue to stem us down this road of global warming. I'm really concerned about global cooling, though, because it comes to our food production and people are going to have to learn how to grow their own food again. I believe that's going to be part of the transition phase here into the cooler climate. Well, you talked about economy and, you know, just-in-time delivery and these types of systems are going to have kinks in them that break at points. So something might not get delivered to your I, local community. You'll be on your own, more or less, for some of the food stuff. We pay $7,000 a megalitre for our water by the time it's delivered to oh, us. Oh, yeah. That's what it works out to. Now, somebody can't grow food economically paying $7,000 a megalitre for their water. The farmer can't hardly do it when he has to pay $100 a megalitre. People now don't water their gardens. They don't water their nature strips anymore. The water authority can't sell enough water to, to cover their costs. And I want to take it into electricity also because that would be a driver too. If you're going to try to do indoor agriculture, mechanized agriculture, you're going to need electricity, obviously. But during that really cold event, the super freeze, I'll, I'll call it 1.0, that swept across Australia earlier in the season, they were charging up to 14000 Australian dollars for a megawatt of power because uh, with the cloudy conditions and the wind being off, that they weren't generating from the renewables at the point that they thought they would. 
And because of that, people were heating their homes more. There was just more drawdown on all the available power. So they, what did they do with the major producers? I, I think it was exclusively smelters and other larger industries. They jacked the price to 14000 Australian dollars for a megawatt. That is incredible That's right. how people could even consider paying that on the retail level. Was that $14 a kilowatt? That's insane. How could you even pay that? We cannot run agriculture as we've known it in Australia, not over the wider areas. There might be some small coastal areas that has higher rainfall that can still be productive, but the greatest majority of inland Australia will be non-productive. Oh. You just shattered a lot of people's hopes and dreams right there because they thought they would be able to grow their own food to try to get through this grand solar minimum. But that is just another bottleneck to think about is your local area going to dry out where there won't even be access to enough water to continue to grow what you might need out for your family to supplement. 25 millimeters a month. So how much can you grow on that? You'd have to really seek out the very drought-hardy plants such as moringa or something that grows under duress and likes drought conditions to grow and thrive. And if it gets extra water, it even produces more leaf or fruit. That is a constraint to think about that I haven't really put into my equations. This is where it comes into when the back's against the wall, the ingenuity of the human spirit to create new devices or invention that was not there before to solve a pain point or a bottleneck at this juncture always seemed to come out of the woodwork somehow. So I'm curious if this time, if water production could be the same way. For the right conditions, yeah, you, you get that. a lot of water condensers and pours off the pipes. But you've got to have fairly moist air to do it. So it works well within the coastal regions of a country where you've got 80 or 90% humidity. But if you're only running about uh, 10 or 20% humidity as we are for most of the year in inland Australia, you don't get very much water. You've got to have a very cold pipe to condense water out of 10 or 20% air. Yeah, which means more electricity, and you cannot squeeze blood from a stone. <laughs> That's all right, David. Well, I don't even know where to go with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to rethink a lot of things myself, because that was the last equation that, thank you for filling that in. The longview.com.au, subscription service there. And again, uh, you can talk to Kevin directly if you're in that service. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kevin. Great interview, and I'm so thankful that I had a chance to talk to you and share ideas. And I'll leave all the links below in the description box so you can go directly to the site. Goodbye, David.